There are shifts in the world that arrive not with thunder, but with the quiet hum of engines turning over at dawn. In the pre-light hours, while cities still dream, steel moves across water, across land, across the invisible lines we call borders. And somewhere, in the careful mathematics of distance and speed, empires recalculate their worth. This is the story of how a nation learned to move, and in moving, changed the balance of everything. August 1947. A country is born from partition, from blood and displacement, from the fracturing of one empire into the hope of two nations. But freedom, they would learn, is only the beginning. India inherited railways built by colonial hands, 25,000 miles of track designed not for connection, but extraction. Roads that led to ports, ports that fed distant capitals, the infrastructure of conquest. For decades, the question was not where India could go, but how. How do you move a billion dreams when the roads crumble beneath them? How do you build a future when the past weighs like iron on every decision? The geography itself seemed to resist. Mountain ranges older than memory, deserts that swallow sound, rivers that both give life and take it away during monsoon. And beyond the borders, neighbors who watched with calculation, powers who measured every move against their own. But beneath the surface, something was stirring. Not loud, not sudden, just the slow, patient accumulation of will. The 21st century arrived in India through ports, through the sound of containers stacking like steel hymns, through the mathematics of global trade written in shipping manifests and currency exchanges. By 2014, something had shifted in the national consciousness. The Modi government announced what they called Gati Shakti, the power of movement. Not just roads, not just rails, a system. An ecosystem where every mode of transport spoke to every other. Where data flowed as freely as cargo. Where the distance between farmer and market, between factory and port, between idea and execution collapsed. They called it multimodal connectivity. The rest of the world called it ambitious. Some called it impossible. But in the dust and noise of 10,000 construction sites, a new India was taking shape. The dedicated freight corridors, rail lines built solely for cargo, running at speeds that transformed the equation of time and distance. Mumbai to Delhi in 12 hours, what once took days. Time, after all, is the only resource we cannot manufacture. India was learning to bend it. Water remembers what land forgets. For centuries, India's relationship with the ocean was one of paradox. A coastline longer than the distance from New York to Los Angeles, and yet underutilized. Ports choked with bureaucracy. Ships waiting days, sometimes weeks, to unload. Then came Mundra, Jawaharlal Nehru port, Vinjam, ports that could swallow a thousand containers before breakfast, where artificial intelligence decided where each box would go, where turnaround time was measured in hours, not days, and the world took notice. Because in the Indian Ocean, geography is destiny. 80% of global oil passes through these waters. Half of the world's container traffic, the Strait of Malacca, that narrow channel between Malaysia and Indonesia, was the bottleneck of Asian trade. But India sat beside it, watching, planning. The Indian Navy began expanding, not with aggression, but with presence, with the quiet assertion that these waters these ancient trade routes 
required guardians who understood their significance. The Americans had called the Indo-Pacific their strategic priority. India was learning to call it home. There is poetry in motion when motion itself becomes transformation. The trains had been there all along, the veins through which India's blood flowed, but they were slow, aging, overwhelmed. Then came the new generation, Vande Bharat, tribute to India, trains capable of 180 kilometers per hour, designed, engineered, and manufactured entirely within Indian borders. But it wasn't just speed, it was dignity. The idea that a farmer's daughter could travel from village to city in comfort, that distance was no longer a sentence, that the nation could move as one, not separated by the accident of birthplace. By 2024, India was laying track faster than any nation except China. The bullet train between Mumbai and Ahmedabad, a project many had mocked as fantasy, had become steel and concrete reality. 320 kilometers covered in two hours. What was once a day's journey compressed into the time it takes to watch a film. But the real revolution was quieter. The freight corridors, the silent workhorses carrying cement, coal, grain, and goods. Moving without headlines, building without applause, this was infrastructure as philosophy. The belief that a nation's worth could be measured in the distance it could move its dreams. Beneath the visible, beneath the trains and ports and highways, ran something invisible, data. India had built not just roads of concrete and steel, but roads of information. The Unified Logistics Interface Platform, a name bureaucratic enough to hide its revolutionary nature. Every truck, every train, every container. Visible, trackable, optimized. What the Americans had spent decades perfecting through private corporations, India was weaving into a public infrastructure. Amazon could tell you where your package was. India could tell you where every package was and reduce the cost of moving them by 20%. The World Bank estimated that India's logistics costs consumed 14% of GDP. The new systems promised to cut that in half. And in a $5 trillion economy, Half of 14% was not just efficiency, it was power. The Americans were watching. Because in the 21st century, whoever moves fastest doesn't just win economically. They define the architecture of how the world works. Power recognizes power before anyone else does. In rooms without cameras, in briefings marked classified, American strategists were recalculating centuries of assumptions. For 70 years, American dominance in Asia rested on two foundations, naval supremacy and the inability of regional powers to project force beyond their borders. But what happens when dominance meets capability? India's new transport infrastructure wasn't just economic. The same rails that moved grain could move tanks. The same ports that received Samsung shipments could resupply aircraft carriers. The same digital systems that tracked mangoes could track missile components. The Pentagon's term for this was dual-use infrastructure. India's term was strategic autonomy. Because India was playing a game the Americans found difficult to parse. Not quite ally, not quite rival. Trading with everyone, aligned with no one. Buying oil from Russia while conducting naval exercises with the United States building ports in Iran while maintaining relations with Israel. The logic was not contradiction. It was geography made policy. Shock is what happens when the future arrives earlier than expected. For decades, American policy toward India had been patient, encouraging, almost paternal. 
the world's largest democracy, a counterweight to China, a market of 1.4 billion. But markets that grow eventually build their own supply chains. Democracies that develop eventually define their own interests. By 2025, India wasn't just buying American technology, it was building competitors to it, not in confrontation, in parallel. The cheapest satellite launches in the world, Indian. The fastest growing digital payment system, Indian. The fourth nation to land on the moon, India. In Washington, the word most often used was concern. In Delhi, the word was arrival. Because the shock wasn't military. It was economic, strategic, philosophical. India had looked at the global order the Americans had built and decided to build a seat at the table large enough for itself. Not by asking permission, by constructing the infrastructure of a relevance to permission. There is a moment in every power shift when the world stops debating whether it's happening and starts calculating what it means. That moment is now. India's transport revolution wasn't staying within India. The same expertise that built ports in Gujarat was being exported to Kenya, to Bangladesh, to Sri Lanka. The same digital systems were being adapted for African nations seeking to leapfrog industrial age logistics. This was soft power built on hard infrastructure. While China built through loans and leverage, India built through knowledge transfer and partnership. While America built through military presence, India built through economic integration. The model was neither Eastern nor Western. It was something older and newer. The same routes that carried spices and silk 2,000 years ago were being reborn in fiber optic and freight corridor. History wasn't repeating, it was rhyming. And in America, the shock was settling into something more complex. Not fear, not quite admiration, but recognition that the world they had shaped was learning to shape itself. That the rules they had written were being rewritten, not in opposition, but in expansion, that the 21st century would not belong to any one nation, but would be negotiated by all who could move fast enough to reach it. There are no endings in the story of power, only chapters that close while others open. India's transport revolution is not complete. Perhaps it never will be. But what has changed is not the destination. It's the understanding that movement itself is sovereignty that in a world where supply chains are weapon systems, logistics is defense. That in an age where time is measured in bandwidth and shipping days, speed is strategy. The shock America felt was not at India's rise. It was at the realization that rise was inevitable, and that inevitability changes calculations. For centuries, the West asked the East, when will you catch up? The East is learning to ask a different question. Catch up to what? Because the infrastructure of the future is being built not to copy the past, but to transcend it. Not to replace one empire with another, but to create a world where empire itself becomes obsolete. India's new generation transport shocked the United States not because it was powerful, but because it was patient. Not because it was aggressive, but because it was inevitable. And the ocean, that ancient witness to every empire that thought itself eternal, continues to remember what we too easily forget, that nations rise not by conquest, but by connection, not by dominance, but by movement, not by shock, but by the quiet, relentless accumulation of will made manifest in steel, data, and distance. You've witnessed the quiet turning of a global chapter. The story continues beyond what any documentary can hold. See what comes next. <laughs>